It's Tuesday, November 27th. Welcome to Market Foolery. I'm Matt Greer, and joining me in studio, we have Motley Fool analysts Andy Cross and Ron Gross. Gentlemen, welcome. How are we feeling today? Hey, you feel doing great. Back. Post Thanksgiving, all doing great. Still a little full. Oh, my me, gosh. Me I, I made <laughs> the mistake of stepping on the scale right when I Bad. got back. Rookie Bad. move. Oh, that is total rookie. Seriously. You got to give the body a little time to adjust. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, water weight. Yeah. That's what, that's what <laughs> I'm going with. We still, I still eating leftovers, guys? No. 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 All done? I still got another day worth. Is that right? Yeah. I like they turkey might be and spoiled. No, no, way. turkey. Guess no turkey. Really, at my family. Yeah, I don't do. Tur- oh, okay. we do. We do make. No, we do make it, but we don't keep it. Oh, okay. Okay, so, that's good. not for leftovers. So yeah, I got some stuffing left and some pies. Okay, I got to eat tonight. Well, good work. Thanks. Well, we are going to dig into some business news. How'd you like that? <laughs> so, that's that's there. Good, good work. We're going to talk Amazon and Apple. But guys, let's kick off with um, a story about United Technologies. This is an industrial manufacturing giant, and Andy. A lot of people don't know this name, United Technologies, but they may know the brands like Carrier and Otis, as in the elevators. Well, United Technologies is splitting itself up into three companies. One company will be called, yes, United Technologies. That'll focus on aerospace. A second company, Otis, maker of elevators and escalators. And the third company, Carrier, yes, heating and AC. So, Andy, what's behind the breakup here? Well, this is the worst kept secret on Wall Street, I think. This has been in the news and rumored um, for at least a year. Uh, and actually, the company's been talking about trying to unlock shareholder value that that euphemism um, for at least a, for a couple of years. Now, now they finally announced it. They just acquired Rockwell Collins for $23 billion. And they talked about after that acquisition, um, it might be time to spit, split up the company. And now they are. So, they're splitting into three different companies. This is a $100 billion company, Max. So, this is not a small company. And it's actually very well run. The operating margins and returns on capital are very good for industrial companies. Not the fastest growing thing in the world. But this is an example of, we see what's happening with Honeywell, another competitor of theirs. We see the disaster at General Electric and what's going on there. That's now a $66 billion company, so it's smaller than United Technologies is. And these are companies that are trying to get more nimble, faster, um, able to, uh, to operate in growing markets, and deliver for shareholders what they may want. So, if you want aerospace, now you have an opportunity to invest just in aerospace. Same with elevators, same with the HVAC businesses, which are both very good businesses. Not the fastest growing businesses, but good businesses. So, I think this is actually a good move for shareholders. Um, I don't know if I'd be buying the stock now, ahead of the spin-offs and split-ups. I may just wait to see to be able to pick which one I want to buy in. Also, determined we have to see how they spin-off. Off. They they do have a lot of debt on the balance sheet, so we have to figure out how that's going to get distributed among the companies and figure out what they're going to do with the dividends, depending on if you're a dividend hunter or not. Because United Technologies does pay a 2.2 percent dividend, so it does for 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 dividend seekers, it does matter which companies you own on that regard. Yep, I agree. I think this makes good sense. Uh, long been pushed by Dan Love over at Third Point, a, a pretty well-known activist investor who is famous for I don't know things like. Like Yahoo, Nestle, uh, Baxter, lots of lots of different large companies that he's gone after in the past. Sometimes the conglomerate model makes sense, and sometimes it doesn't. It works in the case of a company like Berkshire Hathaway because it's very decentralized, and he he makes sure he keeps uh, CEOs in place of each autonomous business unit, and they can run the way they always have. In in a very centralized conglomerate, it, it's very difficult. It takes it's a totally different cost structure mm-hmm. and operating structure to run an aerospace business versus a heating and air conditioning business, and so those often don't work. So splitting it up is often the best way, as Andy said, um, to create shareholder value. And Ron, we were talking before the show, and. You mentioned that your dad worked for an elevator company, but it wasn't Otis. It wasn't I thought Otis was the only game in town here. And I'm racking my brain to recall if they were a competitor to or a supplier to Otis. And I really can't remember. I was, I was in my younger days, um, but there was always a lot of elevator talk going on in my home rails and wiring and cables. So I got to ask your dad works for an elevator company or worked for an elevator company. Yeah. Did the job have a lot of ups and downs? <laughs> Oh but I, bum. I don't even know where to go with you that. Know, you know, just looking at these, looking at these two businesses, Otis is the is a is the largest um, 
uh, elevator and escalator um, operator um, by by a large uh, factor. Um, the next they're they're thirty percent larger than the next nearest competitor, and it's a lot of high recurring revenues. Both these businesses, Otis and Carrier, re- require very little ongoing capital investments. So they're and they're very profitable. The profit margins are somewhere in the high teens. So they're already profitable. They don't grow particularly fast, but they're very stable business, and they're large businesses. We're talking like twelve, eighteen billion dollar businesses in. in Sales per year, so they are large businesses, smaller than the faster growing, more exciting aerospace business. So to Ron's point, like shed those. There's very little overlap. Get rid of those businesses. Let those teams go off and manage that. Let investors choose which ones they want to own. I do think it's interesting because you do see there are studies done about the value of spinoffs. Um, 18 months, two years after the spinoffs happen, and how lucrative they can be for shareholders. So this is something that I'm I'm interested in watching. Which one actually does well over the next five years? Andy is right that Otis is not a fast growing company, but it would have been a wonderful one if you got in on the ground floor. Nice, thank you, nice, thank you. I, and I enjoyed Andy's elevator pitch there. <laughs> oh, wow, oh, man, this is, mean, I, this is this going is, down. Don't <laughs> play. Exactly. Does this show get better from here? <laughs> it can only go up. <laughs> We're on the lobby, people. We're moving up. Okay, let's move on to a Wall Street Journal interview where President Trump suggested that the United States could slap 10% tariffs on iPhones and laptops imported from China. Now, Ron, 10% tariff, that sounds like a lot. What would that mean for Apple and Apple's business? Well, first off, I I don't think it will actually happen. I think it's a negotiating tactic, a lot of bluster. This is not a political show, so I'm going to let everyone decide for themselves what they think about that bluster. Um, But I do think it's a negotiating tactic. Um, It's ahead of the G20 meeting, um, where there'll be uh, further discussions with China about the tariffs and about um, uh, our trade uh, trade war, for lack of a better term. Um, So I don't think it is actually going to happen. But if it did, certainly a company that Size of Apple could weather that storm, and they could do it by passing along um, price increases to consumers. Although I have a feeling they would not do that; um, they probably would eat it. Ten um, percent might translate. I, I've read some some research to around a billion dollar decrease in operating profit. Um, it wouldn't be permanent; it would be you know maybe over a few quarters until things got worked out. Um, so a billion dollars in total. If it was twenty five percent tariff, then of course you're getting maybe triple that, three billion or so. Um, in lost operating profit. Again, Apple, a company the size of Apple could easily weather that storm. It would be certainly a loss in their earnings per share, which impacts valuation. But again, these are all short-term concerns. If you believe in Apple as a company you want to own for the next 10, 20 years, you probably can just ignore it. Yeah, I agree with Ron. A lot of bluster right now coming from the White House, especially ahead of the G20 meeting this Friday. And after the news with with General Motors closing the plants and and uh, the frustrations that uh, President Trump has with them and and talking about them bringing jobs back and not selling and manufacturing cars in China, so I think this is piggybacking on top of that, trying to show a little muscle ahead of a meeting with the G20 countries in uh, on Friday. And you're you're hitting Apple a little bit while it's down, right? The stock has has come under a pretty a decent amount of pressure as most of the Fang stocks have, but Apple in particular is down 22, 23 percent um, from from late August or early September. Um, now this kind of talk, you know, have has people kind of jumping on the bandwagon and selling Apple. Apple off even more. Those are short-term investors, people who are more concerned about the stock going down five or ten percent in the near term, rather than wondering where Apple's going to be five years from now. So again, for foolish investors, for long-term investors, I would uh, be more concerned about whether Apple continues to be an innovative company, whether its ecosystem is going to move forward, continue to generate profits, and and l- worry less about what's going to happen over the next. Two three quarters. You know, it is interesting just to think about the pricing power Apple has. They've been able to raise the average selling price of the iPhone dramatically over the last five years, um, and now uh, some of the units are up above a thousand dollars. So, whether they will decide if this happens, whether they they would keep it and just. just Try to figure out ways to offset that, or if they would actually try to pass that on to consumers, and and would consumers be willing to pay a little bit higher? We do know that iPhone sales um, have kind of just stagnated a little bit, and they've been able to make the revenue growth up on the pricing side, not necessarily the unit side. 
And I'm, I think I'm part of the problem because with I have an iPhone 6s, and and I have no desire to get a new phone. What I will do is I'm going to get the battery replaced because I've already had it replaced once, and now it's awful again. But I don't need a new phone. So are are they kind of at the victim now? I mean, each new iPhone, I know it's better and it takes better photos and all that, but the the difference is so incremental at this point. Aren't there a lot of people like me who are like, you know what? I'm good with my old phone, and I'm just going to change the battery. I think there are a lot of people like you that have maybe the. Eight or the eight S. So the six S. I'm behind the You're time. You're a little yeah. bit. At That's some point, they're, they're going to stop supporting that at some point. I have a seven, and I thought I was a little bit behind. But then, of course, I should always just compare myself to Mac, and I think I look better and pretty much. True story. I was the last guy at the Motley Fool with a BlackBerry, and one of our techies yeah. are like, "Can we yeah. quit supporting you? Can yeah. you just put that away?" Do you have your Palm Pilot too? I do we not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, guys, our final story. A good start to the week for Amazon. In a press release, Amazon called Cyber Monday, quote, the single biggest shopping day in the company's history with the most products ordered worldwide, end quote. What does it mean? Well, it was a good. They, they coined a new term that I had not heard called the Turkey Five, which is that. the. Uh, Sounds like a band, but a really, yeah, exactly. bad, really, really bad band. A terrible <laughs> band, yes. Well, these were five very good days for, like for Amazon. The five days from Thanksgiving or between Thanksgiving and, and Cyber Monday. Clearly, um, the expectations of, of Amazon to do well um, were met. Uh, now, relative to what people may have thought, they didn't announce the, the, the dollar sign, the dollar numbers, but um, clearly, a good day, and you know, for a company that has probably fifty percent, near fifty percent market share of online sales, the days like this are, are very important. We know the 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 value of Singles Day over in China to the likes of Alibaba, which I think set a record this year of more than thirty billion in one day sales. Um, estimates were somewhere around the eight billion dollars spent on Cyber Monday. So, if Amazon got about half of that, that's four billion dollars in in sales uh, across Amazon's platforms. Not bad. Not bad at all. Yeah, they didn't release a lot of data. They just released a lot of big numbers, so it's hard to, to know if they're good. <laughs> so the, the Turkey Five, they did 180 million items over those five days, which sounds like a big number, but I, you know, I don't know if, yeah, if really. people are expecting 200 million or 150 million, and what that translates into dollars. Obviously, um, sounds like a big number. Um, 18 million toys, more than 13 million fashion items on Black Friday and Cyber Monday combined. These are obviously huge numbers. Um, Amazon continues, as Andy said. To be, you know, the major online player here, most most transactions are going through Amazon. You know, it, it, it's interesting. I did a little shopping this weekend and used Amazon and bought bought one or two things across their platform. Used it as the go to place rather than usually searching for Google. And now just kind of go to Amazon. And what's interesting about that is how they are starting to really leverage that into other businesses, including sale, including advertising sales, which is going to be a really nice business for them. And we're already starting to see more and more. Advertising across Amazon's platform. Some estimates are that um, their advertising business is going to grow up to thirty-five, more than thirty-five percent per year over the next five years. Up, uh, one investment bank estimates up to twenty-eight billion dollars yep. in revenues per uh, per year in five years. So, it's things like, as it, as it continues to get more and more consumers to its platforms, they can leverage that. It used to be just AWS. Very important, clearly, but they're gonna, we're starting to see different um, uh, value opportunities for Amazon outside of just traditional e-commerce sales. And when we talk about Apple's ecosystem, you can also talk about Amazon's as well. And you know, the three main growth drivers I would have to say going forward are going to be Prime, um, which kind of primes the pump, <laughs> if yep. you will. You know, over 100 million people pay for Amazon Prime right now. They recently raised the price from $99 to $119. People didn't really seem to bat an eye at that increase, and then as you said, web services, and then advertising is really the up-and-comer um, as well. Yeah. Um, those three things, prime web services and advertising, really, I think, the future growth drivers of Amazon. So, Amazon, that advertising, that comes, I guess, at the expense of Google, right? Yeah, so Google and Facebook are by far the largest online advertiser players, and Amazon by has probably only around 4% of the of the total market in Facebook and Google, the real giants in there, um, through their various platforms. Um, we know we know how hungry Jeff Bezos and that team can be when they are the smaller fish going after larger players, especially going after their margins. So, um, I'm actually a shareholder of 
through Google and Facebook as well. And when I see yep. see that kind of market share and the potential for them to grow, and the way they are using those advertising placements inside the Amazon platform, both on traditional through your laptops or computers, as well as through their on through their um, mobile apps, you do think that's just going to be a really nice, very profitable business for Amazon over the next five, ten years. We talked earlier about Apple's stock getting smacked. Amazon is is also right there with it, along with um, a lot of the other large tech stocks that kind of led the rally up until now. Amazon's off about 22% since September. Um, I'm a shareholder. It's not something I worry about. Um, it's uh, you know these things ebb and flow. It had quite a run. All of these stocks had quite a run. Um, you certainly can't be. It depends when you bought, obviously, but you can't be upset with what's happened over the last several years if you own any of these stocks. So it's something I continue to hold. I continue to be a proud shareholder. I don't worry about the the dips. Okay, so let's bring it back to Cyber Monday, Andy. You mentioned you picked up a few things. What'd you get? Well, I picked up on last night between about eleven and twelve. Just got in to get my my deal promos. Um, I bought some things uh, for the family for Christmas, um, but I did not. Yesterday, I did not buy on Amazon. Friday, I did buy on Amazon. Ron, I bought a ton, maybe literally, of protein bars. Fifteen uh, percent off nice. Cyber Monday sale. Um, Think Thin was the brand for those who are um, interested. Oh, yeah. um, they're, they're pretty tasty, high protein. And, and it sounds like you got a deal. I got a nice deal. <laughs> I bought too many, and they're just going to sit in my pantry, and my wife is going to be like, "What happened yeah. here?" But yeah, you know. yeah, I need to be a little cagey because I think my wife listens to the show. Uh, okay, and there's, there's no way. Your wife there and to the show. At least she probably has not listened. This Long. You know, the more you buy, yeah. the more you save. I, I love that. I was eyeing some Crocs because I only <laughs> have course. I only have I have one pair, and then I have a pair of imitation mm-hmm. Crocs that they're not good. And and Amazon had nine dollar ninety nine cent Crocs. So I mean, they're basically you know yeah. you're making money yeah, yeah, essentially you're giving it away. And and then I'm like, you know what? I just can't get there. So then I looked at some fur lined Crocs, which are really nice. You know, the winter Crocs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then I'm like, you know what? I I've got a I don't know if I can let myself go to yeah, that point. Yeah, I think good decision. Don't you think? Yeah, and I also think you need a hobby. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just I, I want to know the decision making process behind getting the imitation Crocs. Was it like a was it's it like a imitation price? Crab meat yeah, in like, like what? A, I would, in a was there like I will a, tell you this, and I'm a Croc shareholder. I will tell you that I thought, you know what, Crocs imitation Crocs, they're all the same. So I picked these up for like seven dollars at CVS, mm. and they're awful. Yeah, they are not all the same. So yeah. if you think. Yeah. How difficult can Crocs be? Crocs is like the secret yeah. formula to Coca Cola. No one else yeah. can make a Croc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, As so, Buffett says, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're not, I don't know what you're getting with my imitation Crocs, <laughs> but it ain't pretty. <laughs> Nothing good. Nothing okay. Good. So let's close with my Desert Island poll. You should never invest this way. It's just a fun, fanciful way. I never use the word fanciful. fanciful. It's just a fun way to end the show. Um, you're on a desert island for the next five years, and I present you with one of these stocks. Which one are you going with? So we're going to go ahead and break United Technologies huh. up. Yeah. Okay. So you've got United Technologies, Otis, and Carrier, and you also have Apple and Amazon. It's not so easy. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say Amazon. Yeah, I'm going to do. I'm going to take off my value investor hat yeah. uh, and disp- <laughs> and, and take valuation out of the picture, and I'm going to say Amazon as well. I think the avenues of growth that they have before them, not just for the next five years, but the next ten or twenty years, are pretty special, and I have to go with them. I thought you were going to go Otis because no, definitely because because the upside. for nostalgia. <laughs> oh <Yeah>. man, <laughs> it's <laughs> going through the roof. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's a free show. Just remember, people, it is a free show. Market Foolery at fool.com is our email. If you have any good elevator puns that we did not cover, <laughs> then we want to hear them. Your questions, your comments, Market Foolery at fool.com. Ron and Andy, thanks for joining me. Thank thanks, you, Mac. As always, people on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and the Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. That's it for this edition of Market Foolery. The show is mixed by Dan Boyd. I'm Matt Greer. Thanks for listening, and we will see you tomorrow.